Well, good morning. Welcome to the fourth Sunday of Advent. Okay, Advent, the celebration of the coming, right? The coming of hope, the coming of peace, the coming of joy. And this morning, the celebration that Christ has come to display God's love. How do you know that God loves you? Well, he came. And he came to go to the cross. That the Father has poured out the full measure of his wrath towards our sin upon his Son out of love for us. Guys, that's our journey, our voyage this morning. So turn with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. We're going to pick up in verse 6. Now, I know at this point, um, this movie is somewhat dated, but how many of you have seen the movie Saving Private Ryan? It came out in 98, so, uh, you know, time flies. The plot goes like this. When the United States government must tell the Ryan family that three of her four sons have been killed in World War II, a special mission is given to find Private Ryan, the fourth son, and to send him home to his already grieved mother. So the movie is filled with history. It's known for the graphic nature of war as it portrays D-Day and moving plot lines. And as it does, there is a crisis moment where the soldiers discuss their willingness to lay down their lives for another whom they don't know. They've never met him. So they talk, and they, it begins with compassion, right, for a mother who's lost three of her sons and the evils of war. But the longer they think about it and discuss, they say, yeah, but what about my mom? And the dialogue continues along the ideals of love for country and good versus evil. But when it's all said and done, most settle on the hope that if they accomplish this mission, it means that they will get to go home sooner. You see, these men had to assess the worth of their mission against the risk of their lives. Now, it's that same sort of assessment that Paul is going to make in our passage this morning in Romans 5. That is this. Here's his point. It is very rare that one is willing to lay down one's life for another. And there is always an assessment of the value that is involved, right? Only if he is good and a righteous man, only because I love her, but never in the instance of he's a pretentious traitor. Or she is an unfaithful liar. No one is laying down their lives then. Except God. Listen to Romans 5. I'm going to begin in verse 5. And read through 10. It says, And hope does not disappoint Because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who is given to us. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one would hardly die for a righteous man, all right, though for perhaps a a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than, having now been justified by his blood, 
that we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Will you pray with me? Our heavenly father, it is our deep prayer and desire this morning that through the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would allow us to see more clearly the truth of your love towards us. On the cross, establish, planted, that you would enlighten our eyes to see and to understand that truth afresh with renewed passion this morning that so much of our lives, our view of love is circumstantial based on how we feel in that moment. But Father, your love is fixed in your son's death. And we pray it is only a gift from you that you allow us to see this. And we pray that you would allow us to see that and to understand it more this morning. And that the deepest cry of our heart, Father, is to know that you love us. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, the love of God is actually a difficult topic and subject to preach on. Now, initially, that's surprising because culturally, if there is a God, then we can all agree, well, then he must be loving. And he must love me because, by the way, what's not to love? The benevolent grandpa in the sky who is patient and understanding and his love most of all is non-judgmental. All right? He he is happy to let everyone do whatever they want as long as they follow their heart. And don't murder anybody, of course. You see our culture is hopped up on self-esteem and quotes the self mantra on repeat that I am loved and to love me means you agree with everything I do. But guys, this spongy notion of what love means in reality, it doesn't stand up to the pressures and to the waves of life. Seriously, look around and pause and think because We believe, I'm talking culture, we believe that we are more loved. We believe in the power of positive self-esteem more than ever. And yet, we are more fragile and broken than ever. Why? Guys, because culturally, our house is built upon the sand. And friend, Jesus offers a rock to build our lives upon, an unshakable kingdom. And the rock is his love. But we must allow God to define the terms, God's vocabulary to define reality. So what does the Bible say about you and God's presentation of love for you? I'm gonna ask you this morning to wade into the waters of God's wrath, his hatred against sin. And I know that your natural response is going to recoil. Here comes the pastor with this hellfire and brimstone as you look over your shoulder for the exit. But listen to me. If you underestimate God's hatred for sin, you will never comprehend his love on the cross. 
And you'll always be left with a spongy, sentimental, performance-driven love, sand to build your life upon. So we must begin with the holiness of God and his hatred towards sin. Friend, the Bible says that none can stand before God unless his anger is propitiated. That's what Paul says just a couple chapters prior to where we are in Romans 5. In Romans chapter 3, that the cross of Jesus Christ was a propitiation for sin. Now, I know that's a big theological word, and it doesn't mean it. I bet you didn't use that this week when you were in your everyday life. It is from the Latin word propitio, meaning to appease God's anger or wrath. Now, wait a second, Pastor. Are, are, are we to think of a God who, who requires us throwing a virgin into an active volcano in order to placate? Is he fuming, frustrated, subject to mood swings and temper tantrums like a little child? The first thing to say about the wrath of God is that it is part of the gospel. It is the part that we tend to ignore. It's odd that we don't mind our own anger and outrage. Have you ever noticed? Guys, there's a lot of anger in us. Just listen to social media or cable news. Outrage is our entertainment. All the time we're spewing righteous indignation. We blast injustice. We vent our own moral fervor to one another all the time. It's the water cooler talk while you're at work. Can you believe the boss? I can, how dare he do that? But the thought of God being angry, well, who does he think he is? Well, good question. Because God is the most joyful, patient, delightful person ever. To know him is to have eternal life. And he is the most holy wrathful, just, jealous, passionate person ever. And everything I just listed, he is in perfect balance. Perfect balance. Because there is a fundamental reality that both aspects, the love of God and the wrath of God must exist. Here's why. Because to be passionate about life is to hate death. To be zealous for the glory of God is to hate those who rebel against his name. And to love someone is to hate that which destroys them. Right? How much does a parent hate the cancer that is killing their child? You see, God is not a passive observer. He is all in. And his wrath shows how magnificent his love is. It is completely on a different scale than you and I could ever comprehend. His ways are not our ways. So peer with me into the darkness. And consider God's words. That God is the one painting the picture. Not you or I. Consider where you were outside of Christ. Look at the verse. Look at verse 6. It says that you were helpless and ungodly. Verse 8 says that you were a sinner. Verse 9 says that God's wrath was fixed upon us. And verse 10 says that you and I 
outside of Christ, we're enemies of God. Friend, the Bible does not hold back considering your self-esteem. And God doesn't say that you are innocently misplaced before coming to Christ, but rather that you are an enemy of God by nature, actively fighting against the things of God, ungrateful, prideful, engaged in espionage, dragging others into sin with you, ignoring the blessings of God in your life, not giving thanks, an enemy. There is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. And God's wrath was against you because he hates sin. Now, stay with me. Do not check out. Sin is an attack on his name. Rebellion against his reign. It is you declaring, I will do what I want to do. I will determine right and wrong. And sin is the source of all death. And God loves life. And the Bible says God will have his day of wrath. The pictures at the end of the Bible when Jesus returns and they are hiding from the wrath of the Lamb, that there will be a time when God will rid the entire universe of sin. And you and I, as the enemy of God, were completely helpless. Elsewhere, the Bible says that you were dead. Friend, this means that you weren't looking for God. You didn't have any inkling towards God. But that God came and opened your blind eyes. That his Holy Spirit came and awoken you from the spiritually dead. Now take a long look at the cross. God's presentation to you. The cruelest form of pain ever invented. Maximum shame as a public parade and mockery. The Roman world laughed at Christianity. How could your God die? And how could he die in the most shame-filled way possible? On a cross. Take a long, thoughtful look because God has presented him to you. He is speaking about his perfect emotions towards your sin. Friend, now you are ready. Now you are ready to hear of the love of God because the diamond sparkles more brilliantly than ever with a suitable background to set off its shine. But God, but God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet sinners, while we were enemies, while we were the, the, the object of his wrath, while we were helpless, then, then he loved us. Then he died for us. At our worst, when we were unlovable, then he loved us. And then he died for us. When I proposed to Lane more than 20 years ago, and I told her that I loved her and that I wanted to spend the rest of my life with her. Okay? What did I mean by my declaration 
I love you. Or what do you mean whenever you declare to your spouse, I love you? And if there's a romantic inkling in any of us, it it sounds like this. Roses are red and violets are blue and I love your smile and I love your hair too. (laughs) All right, but, but seriously, whenever we tell someone I love you, whenever I tell my wife or, or, or I press into her, I love you. How do I know I love you? I love that twinkle in your eye. I love the way that I feel whenever I'm around you. You make me come alive. I am physically, emotionally, spiritually attracted to you. I love you. Notice, when we say I love you, we are saying I love you because I find you so lovely. But is that what the Bible means whenever it says God loves us? Did God find us so lovely? But God demonstrates his own love for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When you were dead in your sin, he was pleased to crush his son. Can you believe it? It is magnificent. Friend, what qualifies you to enjoy the love of God in the death of Christ? Who qualifies? Sinners. They are the only people that he died for. See, if your problems are always someone else's fault, if you come to God standing upright, ready to defend your case, then the cross condemns you. But if you are far from God, if you've sinned and you keep on sinning, and you are ashamed and you wish that you could trade in your record for a perfect one. If your conscience knows that you deserve the wrath of God and your only hope is in the mercy of Jesus, then God longs for you to know something, that he delights to see you through the death of his son. That in love, He nailed your sin, your certificate of debt to the cross, and you bear it no more. And he will spend all of eternity unfolding and pouring out his love and his mercy upon you. You mean his love towards me is not performance-based? You mean he's not mad or disappointed? Beloved, that's the good news. That his love towards us is fixed for all who are in Christ Jesus. Have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ this morning. Because if you haven't, today is the day of salvation. And if you have, then beloved, when I focus your heart towards the cross, the love of God in the cross, your heart begins to be filled with joy and love doesn't it? Look with me again at verse 5. It says, the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who is given to us. That is 
You love him because the Holy Spirit has poured out love inside of you in your heart. And that at the end of the day, there, you have an ability as a born again believer to calm your heart and to ask yourself the question, do I love him? And the answer is yes. Amen. Hallelujah. The answer is yes. Do you know how, how just ground shaking and, and, and spiritual formation uh, that was in my heart to, to know and to understand, wait, I love him. I love him. Hallelujah. That's the spirit of God inside of me. I love him. He's poured that inside of me. Now, truth be told, that love for him still wanes a little bit, doesn't it? That inevitably we have days and seasons where the clouds roll in and the light grows dim and we forget the love of God. We sin and in our disobedience we feel distant from him. We ask God or we say to God, God, I can't feel you right now. Am I alone in this? What must we do in this season? Beloved, the, repre- the repeated refrain of the New Testament is look again to the cross. Look again to the cross. Friend, I don't care how you feel. What do you know about the love of God in the cross? Has he driven a stake in the, in the ground declaring, I am loved? Listen, he stared straight at our sin and said, I love you even there. And that is such good news, right? Because if he loved us there, then he loves us here. Look to the cross. Look to the cross. Why is it that Paul prays? Have you paid attention to the prayers of the New Testament? Paul prays, God, I pray that Christians would have the eyes of our heart opened. Why would you pray that? I thought they were already open. No, no, no. It's because we see in part. And sometimes our vision gets foggy. Why is it in Ephesians 3.18 that Paul prays that believers would be able to comprehend what is the width and the length and the height and the depth of the love of Christ? It is because even though the love of God has been poured out in our hearts, it still gets diminished. We, we forget What must we do? Look again. Meditate again of God's presentation of his love for you on the cross. So I'd like to share with you one of my favorite stories. I've shared it with you before, and so I can only use this every couple of years, or you'll think he just says that one over and over again, but it's one of my absolute favorite stories. And my first ministry stop, uh, my first ministry stop was, was hard. It was, it was difficult. It was, it was a season of life where you're just kind of grinding. It, you, you come out of seminary, you have all these hopes and dreams, and you're the next Billy Graham, and God's just going to light the world on fire. And then you get into ministry, and it's just hard. It's just hard. So I'd gone through a really hard season, and you have hopes. You just want to see God move, and, and it wasn't happening. And then... One, one day uh, at church, uh, I got news that it was devastating news that, that just kind of crumbled all, all the plans and future and things that I had. And so immediately after church, uh, my family w- went out to lunch and 
I was so devastated, I couldn't, I couldn't even eat. That's how devastated I was, okay? <laughs> so I, I just go home and have a pity party. I, I literally went home and I, I sat in a chair and, and I didn't move uh, for about an hour and a half. You ever been there? You ever had a pity party? You ever felt like nothing's working out and, and you're always questioning the love of God and you're like, God, I don't even know why I signed up for this and all that stuff. And I'm just sitting there having a complete pity party. It was about an hour and a half later because my, my family got home from, uh, from lunch and it, you could hear the garage door and then, then I could hear the, the pitter patter of, I showed you this picture, that, that's what Ian and Eli looked like about this time, okay? And so he's, he's probably three or four, okay? But I hear the pitter patter of, of Ian because he's coming back to the to the back room to find me. I was noticeably absent from lunch, obviously. And uh, he comes back there. He enters the room to check on daddy and he, he can tell, right? The atmosphere in the room is, is real dour. And he says, daddy, I love you. And I say, I love you too, son. He says, no, Daddy, say it louder. Daddy, I love you. I say I love you too, son. No, Daddy, say it louder. Daddy, I love you. I love you too, son. And before you know it, as this ends, him and I are shouting back and forth, I love you. Now, what do you think that did to my emotions in that moment? It overshadowed them, right? It called me out of my funk. It awoke my soul and said, no matter what is going on, this guy right here and my love for him outweighs anything that I'm going through. Friend, Friend, listen to me. If my son and his love for me and my love for him can call me, can awaken my soul greater than whatever my circumstances are, what can the cross of Christ do for your soul? When you consider again and afresh and anew, did he not suffer pain because he loved you? No, 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 no. Say it louder. Did he not suffer shame, unbearing shame, as he hung upon the cross naked, as they jeered at him, because he loved you? No, 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 no. Say it louder. Did he not become forsaken by God the Father for you? Did he not kneel in the garden and sweat blood? He did not beg. If there's any other way than being forsaken from you, Father, did he not do all of that because he loves you? It's the love of God and the cross of Christ, and we've heard it time and time and time again. But in your trial, my friend, would you Look upon it, fresh and new. Would you allow it to stir your heart that he loves you? Right now, would you stand to your feet? As the praise team comes to lead us in a final song, would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father and King Jesus, continue to stir our affections for you. Allow us to comprehend your hatred for sin, but that your love was greater still. That if you loved us then, how much more so now that you've poured out your love in our hearts 
And even if it wanes, even when we're disobedient, allow us to understand that you love us and that you were pleased to crush your son for us. Father, I know because I know my own heart that all across this room, we long to hear afresh that you love us and that you're not mad at us and that your love is fixed towards us who are in Christ. Father, if there is anyone here this morning that does not know you, would you call them to yourself? Would you allow them to see and to respond this morning? In Jesus' name, amen.